Hello, good evening, Dr. Vrishali. Are you there? Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Ah, yes. Hello, sir. Uh, can you hear me? I, because I'm not able to hear you. Uh, yes, yes, I can hear you. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. So, uh, did you check your slides? Yeah, I'll just uh, try it again once. Yeah. That's visible? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, great. Yeah. You can change them, right? I can, I can, yes. Okay. So on an average, how many people join normally? Uh, so there might uh, some very uh, like a few people will join right now. But the thing is that uh, it gets recorded. Uh, yeah. So on YouTube, we get lots of hits and a uh, lot of people watch this program. Okay. That's good. That's good. Yeah, so this is now the uh, third program in the series. Okay. So yeah. this is happening every uh, like. So it is every night actually. Uh, so we have program for Sunday night also, and then uh, Monday night also. So, that so will... that's like every day, or of like because week. it's a prematurity yeah, week. Ah, uh, correct, correct. It's just because it's a National Newborn Week. Yeah. We are having uh, kept it like every night. Okay, great. Yeah, for this week, uh, then we'll then we'll do it. Uh, let's see. I mean, we are not doing a regular CME. Yeah. But uh, for this uh, National Newborn Week, we have uh, arranged few lectures. Okay. So, so, um, so we will not uh, wait for any participants to join in. Uh, yeah. What has happened is like some uh, some people are also uh, busy with uh, Mahapedicon. Maha okay, yeah, that's right. So, Dr. Rishikesh Thakur is also at Mahapedicon. Okay. So he informed me that he won't be able to join tonight. Yeah. 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 When Dr. Shilpa is also at Yes, yes, yes. Madam is also there. Yes, yes. And the only thing was that uh, because I have a CME to attend immediately post this and I have to talk there also. That's why okay. I was asking whether I can start at 8.30 sharp. Yeah, yeah. We will start at 8.30 yes, sharp. Yes. I mean, we won't wait for anyone. So just one minute and I'll start um, the yes. introduction. Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, let's see. so we'll start now. Okay, a uh, warm welcome to all our viewers uh, who are watching this program. So this is a third uh, lecture from series of for the CME series for National Newborn Week, which we are celebrating from 14th of November to 21st of November. So it is just to uh, make you aware about the challenges and burdens of uh, neonatal care and uh, what. Uh, and how, so through this awareness, uh, we hope that there is an impact on reducing mortality and morbidity in these newborns. So, so we have arranged few lectures, so just few house rules. So everybody should be on mute. If there are any questions, please put them on the chat box. And you can also watch this lecture later on because it will be recorded and posted on YouTube. So today we have with us uh, Dr. Vishali Bichkar who is a DM a senior consultant neonatologist currently who is working at Motherhood Hospital. She has done her DM neonatology training from Cyan Hospital and she was also previously working with Aditya Birla Hospital. She has more than 15 years of experience and that's why uh, we have invited her for this talk. So today she'll be talking about the prognostic factors in neonatology with relation to perinatal asphyxia. So there are a lot of factors like uh, which will determine the perinatal outcome or neurological outcome. Uh, so if you look at um, so if you look at the uh, what Abgar score the baby has, how, what resuscitation baby has required, uh, what, how the amplitude uh, integrated EEG looks like, and even the cranial imaging. So she will be giving us a, a detailed explanation about how the prognostic factors. Uh, relation with birth asphyxia, neonatal seizures, and IVH. So, 
with this i welcome you dr vishali bichkar and uh, so it's all yours thank yes. you so much sir for this warm welcome and uh, so uh, today i'll be talking about prognostic factors as it is very much important when we are dealing with critical newborns in the icu when it comes to not only managing the baby and predicting their outcomes further but also helps in counseling sessions when we deal with relatives at the same time when we are uh, projecting uh, what the baby might have later or maybe the further uh, neurological sequelae so for that this uh, three uh, distinct topics i have taken with respect to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy intraventricular hemorrhage and neonatal seizures so let us start the first one which is asphyxia as we all know that american academy of pediatrics and american college of obstetric and gynecology has defined particular uh, parameters for defining asphyxia one of the parameter being profound metabolic or mixed acidemia in the umbilical artery blood sample wherein the ph is less than 7 uh, if the abgar scores are 0 to 3 for longer than 5 minutes also if the baby has uh, developed some neurological sequelae post this resuscitation with respect to seizures coma or hypotonia and if the baby has undergone some multiple organ involvement uh, post this asphyxia so when we talk about prognostication definitely the degree of maturity at birth plays a major role so if we uh, could just guess anyways also that a full term baby because the organ systems are totally uh, quite matured uh, definitely uh, they have better survival and with respect to long term mortality though the premature survivals are slightly lesser but the impact can be seen almost equivalent with respect to premature and term gestation so we all know because we uh, day to day practice we use that apgar scoring system whether it is a perinatal asphyxia or not so this conventional apgar scoring system uh, which has got five signs i won't go much into detail but overall if we score a baby a baby who is having scores between 7 to 10 we considered as normal in between uh, 4 to 6 we will say that the baby was moderately depressed and 0 to 3 the baby has been severely depressed uh, this is about convention of gar when we uh, define it we uh, actually plot the baby at 1 minute and 5 minute but then by this extended of gar score equally crucial uh, so for with respect to perinatal asphyxia if the baby has got lower scores we definitely give some intervention and try to reach of gars which are around 7 or beyond wherein this extended of gar scoring picture comes into place uh, extended of gar scores uh, are the scores which we when we uh, plot them they are uh, beyond 5 minutes so 5 minutes 10 minutes 15 minutes or 20 minutes so if we could see that 1 minute abgar score if it is zero or if it is an apparent stillbirth still many of the babies they survive and have normal uh, neurological outcomes but the same abgar score of zero at 10 minutes uh, most of the babies uh, likely possibility that they will die or whoever survive will definitely have a abnormal neurological outcome and that is why for newborn babies when we talk about how much time to continue resuscitation the time duration limit is up to 20 minutes if at 20 minutes of extended abgar if the abgar is still zero it's uh, we stop resuscitation at that point of time uh, if we could see uh, this particular chart which has been mentioned about the abgar scoring system at 1 5 10 and 15 and 20 minutes if you could just check at around 15 to 20 minutes it definitely uh, gives us an idea that this baby is almost 50% at risk of dying within the first year and also if the abgar score is 0 to 3 at 20 minutes almost 60% of the babies they will land up having uh, some sequelae uh, later in life so that is how the abgar scoring system is very much important for prediction of further neurodevelopmental as well as the mortality sequelae for the baby as per the committee opinion by uh, acog as well as ap uh, the prediction of outcome uh, at 1 minute abgar score if it is 0 to 3 it does not predict the outcome but 5 minute abgar score yes definitely it can predict the outcome with respect to neonatal mortality and the risk of poor neurological outcomes are higher when the abgar scores are 3 or less than that at 10 minutes 15 minutes or 20 minutes that's why uh, plotting the extended abgar score uh, to define further neurological sequelae or mortality is a has got a major role then comes the specified abgar scoring 
so specified abga scoring is equivalent uh, for a term and preterm baby so it doesn't uh, take gestational age into consideration absolutely but herein we define the reflex or the tone based on that particular age whether it is appropriate or not that's why uh, given specified as the name for the abga scoring i would like to also add on to the expanded abgar so whenever we have abgar scores which are less than 6 we do uh, definitely uh, get some interventions they come into picture so if we add on those intervention to define abgar scoring system this is what we call it as expanded abgar so it, it is in the fine uh, it, it's a mnemonic called combined so c standing for cpap o for oxygen supplementation mb for bag and mask ventilation i for intubation n for neonatal chest compression e for suffocation and administration and d for any drug intervention so if we have any of the intervention which was performed the scoring is going to be zero if there was no intervention utilized to get the abgars beyond 7 uh, uh, definitely we'll score it as 1 so this is what is going to be a combined ab abgar scoring so this is a combination of expanded abgar and specified abgar if the combined abgar scores are less than 6 it definitely uh, gives uh, uh, betterment in the predicting of poor outcomes as compared to just conventional extended specified or expanded abgar so it's always better to score it as per the combined abgar scores which will predict uh, the sequelae in a better way the next uh, entity which uh, comes into picture is fetal acid based status so as we have defined uh, asphyxia with respect to the first parameter was ph of less than 7 in the arterial uh, blood gas sample uh, it is a dictum that when a baby has not cried at birth it's always better to have a cord gas or a gas within the first one hour of life because that is wherein we will uh, get to know that how severe the insult was whether it was an acute insult or a chronic insult so So when we talk about fetal acidemia, it can happen because of accumulation of carbon dioxide, thus converting into carbonic acid, or it can be metabolic acids like lactate, ketone bodies, or it can be combination of both the things. We all know that the carbon dioxide is highly diffusible, and it can actually give rise to rapid alterations in the fetal pH. And the best part of it is that it resolves also very quickly. Uh, but when it comes to metabolic acids, whether it is anaerobic glycolysis which is taking place, it has got slower and more sustained alterations in the fetal pH. Uh, umbilical arterial pH is anywhere between seven point two four to seven point two seven. When it is less than seven, we take it as asphyxia. And uh, if we see the base axis also, it is uh, somewhere maximum. Uh, it's minus five point six for a term babies. so uh, when a fetus is exposed to any acute hypoxic ischemia event in 5 minutes there would be definite drop in the pao2s from 25 which is the no average pao2s for a fetus to less than 5 mm of mercury in just 5 minutes at the same time there is increment in the carbon dioxide uh, up to like from 45 normally to up to 100 also which can make the ph drop from 7.3 to 6.8 within just 10 minutes so this is for acute hypoxic insult for chronic insults it will more cause anaerobic glycolysis and thus landing up having the base deficit which is more than 60 or in the ph uh, changes as well so if you could see that why it is crucial to uh, have this ph at birth or within first hour because we will be able to guess that the baby is going to land up having either multi organ dysfunction or it's just going to be the encephalopathy part which will be dealing with if you could see this particular chart uh, if the ph is anywhere between 6.9 to 6.99 most of the time that baby doesn't have uh, much of affection of cns as well as other organ systems but if the same time the ph is anywhere between 6.6 to 6.7 most of the organ systems they get involved so that is how uh, we will get to know and we'll be more cautious about other organ involvements as well uh, in this case Uh, any baby who has got ph of less than 6.6 the survival chances are absolutely zero uh, with respect to base deficit as i told you that if the deficit is less than 12 uh, it rarely would result in moderate to severe neurological signs but if the deficit is more than 60 Fifty percent of the babies can land up having moderate to severe neurological signs, so which we should be aware of to monitor. So, if you could see here as well, that if they are severe, uh, definitely uh, the risk 
of having issues later is going to be with respect to neonatal uh, neonatal encephalopathy are going to be higher about lactic acid uh, we all know that it cannot cross placenta so whatever lactic acid, uh, if we are taking a baby sample for arterial blood glass analysis, it is fetal in origin. Okay, So in that also, if the lactate levels are more than 4.1, uh, that can predict neonatal encephalopathy with a very good sensitivity as well as specificity. So when we talk about arterial blood glass, pH, the base axis and the lactate determination is very much crucial. And it is not only a one-time uh, ABG, but also if the same changes are persistent beyond two hours beyond delivery, that will also help us uh, predicting the outcomes in uh, future about the baby. The time uh, to have onset of spontaneous and sustained respiration is crucially important, not only the neonat uh, like the neurological signs, but also with respect to respiration. If the baby has been apneic for more than 30 minutes, uh, the baby uh, will get severe damage. Okay. And uh, furthermore, the neonatal neurological syndrome, uh, based on the severity, the presence of seizures, and also the duration of abnormality, I'll be discussing each and everything in detail. So severity, definitely we have certain scoring systems in order to define what degree of asphyxia or HI it has been. One of that is Thompson score. I won't go much in detail about it. But usually most of us, we use SONART and SONART scoring system to define whether it is a mild, moderate or severe HI. If the HI is milder, 100% of the babies are normal on follow. If it is moderate, 80% of the babies are normal. Uh, if they resolve their, sim like res resolve their symptoms within for seven days, definitely they have uh, normal outcomes. But if the symptoms last for more than seven days, they might land up having abnormal neurological sequelae later. In severe of the cases, 50% of them, they die. And reminder might land up having some of the other neurological sequelae. So overall, if we compare different scoring system, if it is a severe encephalopathy, 50 to 100 percent of the babies are going to be having uh, are going to be severely abnormal on follow up or uh, there are chances of death in such babies. So when we talk about presence of seizures, we normally label the baby as into moderate encephalopathy uh, or stage 2 HI. So definitely seizures increase the neurological sequelae risk uh, by almost 40 fold. Okay, if the seizures are persistent and they are not getting controlled and requiring multiple anticonvulsants, that also adds on to the death and subsequent neurological deficits. And if the seizures are early onset, the risk further increases by 75%, especially if they are happening within the first four hours. So overall combination of of the severity of the syndrome as well as presence of seizures can predict outcome to a larger extent. If, as I already discussed, if the abnormal features, they subside by five to seven days, it is one of the excellent prognostication sign that there are very less chances that the baby might have uh, neurological abnormalities later in life. So, uh, so this was about the clinical assessment and APGAR and also the ABG parameters. Now let us move on to the EG parameters. So this is what is a conventional EG. Normally, uh, EG in HIV evolves with decrement in the amplitude as well as the frequency. So there will be flattening of the uh, interspike in, uh, periods. Uh, and uh, that is how they further go into a fewer burst or more voltage separation and landing up into the isoelectric form of EG. So what are the factors which have associated with favorable outcomes? Even if there was mild depression on day one, if the background activity becomes normal by day seven, it is associated with favorable outcomes. If uh, if it is uh, if it's got burst separation pattern on day one or if there is a flat tracing on any of the days, or if that depression which was there on first day persists beyond 12 days, it is found to be associated with unfavorable outcomes overall. So this is another form of EG which normally most of the NICUs they have, which is amplitude integrated EG. I won't be going in detail about amplitude integrated EG, but whatever abnormalities we have to look for are these. So if there is detection of severe abnormalities, so it can be either continuous low voltage or a flat trace or a burst separation pattern. If that has been noticed in the first hours of life, it has got positive predictive value of between 80 to 90 percent. But uh, many of the abnormalities can revert back within the first 24 hours. So just not a single EG which is performed within uh, 24 hours 
we have to repeat the EEG after 24 hours. If there is a reversion of this abnormality, definitely that adds on to the favorable outcomes in 60% of the cases. And uh, if it, it should not be a single factor which should define. It has to be a comprehensive help with respect to uh, the APGAR scoring, the neurological uh, examination of the baby, and along with amplitude integrated EEG. So this combination is going to give us betterment in predicting the mortality as well as uh, neurodevelopmental outcomes. So most of us, we don't prefer doing CT for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, but if we don't have any access to MRI, uh, because MRI might take slightly longer time if the baby is not in the position uh, to be shifted for MRI, uh, we can opt for CT if your center has it. So in that case, we have to just uh, see that if the CT is normal, most of the babies do not end up having neurological deficits. But if it is showing marked diffuse hypodensities, they uh, will most likely have some or the other sequelae. So if it's a major degree of intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, they will also def def definitely exhibit neurological deficits on follow-up. And the best time to perform a CT is anywhere between two to six weeks of age. Uh, this I'm going to talk about subtly about ultrasound with respect to HIE. So when we talk about uh, changes of ultrasound uh, in neonate was undergone uh, hypoxic ischemic insult. So if the baby has got eco densities and which persists for beyond 14 days, the risk of having cerebral palsy is more. It also is based uh, dependent on whether it is unilateral persistent eco densities or bilateral or the position of eco densities. So if it is bilateral or if it's got parietal or occipital uh, predominance, then the risk of having cerebral palsy is anywhere between 65 to 75 percent. Regarding MRI, we uh, most of us are aware that there are certain patterns of injury which we see, uh, either selective neuronal necrosis or parasagital cerebral injuries or periventricular leukomalacia or certain foci of ischemic necrosis. So it is entirely dependent on what pattern we uh, are dealing with on the MRI. Normally, MRIs are performed anywhere between first to second weeks post this insult because the changes take subtle time to be shown onto MRI. Uh, so the most uh, common uh, uh, sign which we see on MRI is abnormal signal intensities in the posterior limb of internal capsules. If these are abnormal signal intensities, 100% of the babies, they do have some sequelae on follow-up. And normally, when they are associated with involvement of basal ganglion and thalamus as well. Um, the next uh, thing which helps us to define prognostication is uh, um, anterior uh, Arterial cerebral artery resistance index, which uh, most of our ICUs, they are well equipped to do uh, functional neuro ultrasounds, wherein we can actually uh, see the flow in the anterior cerebral artery and can uh, take the RI into consideration. So when we are performing this RI, RI uh, we have to do it after 24 hours. Uh, and if that RI during that time is less than 0.55, it indicates that uh, there is definitely disturbed auto regulation with respect to the cerebral circulation in this babies. Uh, I'll be discussing what about in pre-cooling era and now when we are using therapeutic hypothermia uh, to prevent further injuries, there are difference of opinions. For uh, pre-cooling era, uh, the uh, ACA RI was performed anywhere between 24 to 62 hours. But when we talk about uh, when the baby is already undergoing therapeutic hypothermia, it is better to perform uh, in the uh, when the baby is uh, getting back to the normal temperature. So rewarming phase or once the baby has uh, been stopped with therapeutic hypothermia after 72 hours. So in that case, if it is less than 0.55, uh, the, the definite, uh, there would be some poorer uh, neurological outcomes or death. So overall, if we see the prognostication test, I'm not talking about the uh, severity and everything. It's just about the test. This slide shows about the test. So amplitude integrated EG in the first six hours and repeating after 24 hours is going to give us better sensitivity as well as specificity uh, to define the prognostication. MRI uh, in second week will give us better uh, pool sensitivity, uh, but a bit of 
but yes, the sensitivity being good, MRI is one more uh, thing which we should be taking into consideration. So as I told you that regarding pre-cooling era and the cooling era, RI uh, with respect to cranial ultrasound uh, within first 24 to 62 hours uh, was found to have better prediction. Uh, but with cooling era, uh, it's not as good uh, it been performed within 24 to 62 hours. But if we plan to do it later in cooling or after reforming, it is found to give us a better prediction. Conventional MRI anywhere between first to uh, second week would be better. And MR spectroscopy, yes, definitely certain spikes are noted. Uh, but I won't go much into detail because that's normally performed for academic interest, like because each and every unit uh, doesn't have this MRS uh, into the center. So this was about hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. I actually wanted to add on certain case scenarios, but because of the time constraints, I couldn't do that. Let us move further to intraventricular hemorrhages and uh, the, how to predict their uh, sequelae or the outcomes of the baby. So I have put certain, uh, uh, this slide is about the grading of uh, intraventricular hemorrhage. So this is what is grade one, grade two, grade three, and uh, I would say a specific notation with uh, periventricular hemorrhage. So we use this Volpe system uh, to grade the intraventricular hemorrhage. Grade one is anywhere uh, involvement less than 10% of the ventricular area. Grade two, 10 to 50%. Grade three, more than 50%. Usually it is associated with ventricular dilatation. And if it is periventricular uh, eco density, uh, it is given a separate notation rather than uh, grading it as four as per papillary's grades with respect to CT scan. And most of us, we are aware that uh, the hemorrhages are more common in preterm babies in the first three days of life. So 90% of the hemorrhages happen in the first three days of life. Very rarely, 10% can happen anywhere between fourth to seventh day. Uh, so once we get any uh, of the baby having either grade one work or grade two bleeding, we need to follow up them over the next three to five days because there is likely progression of hemorrhages. So 20 to 40% of such hemorrhages can progress. Uh, and how does IVH progress? Most of the grade one and grade two hemorrhages, they are followed by resolution. So if a baby has brought, got grade one and grade two, we follow up them for next five to seven days. If there is no further progress, uh, so likely further the uh, hemorrhage is going to resolve by its own. But if it is a grade three hemorrhage, it starts resolution anywhere between first to three weeks, but can get associated uh, with ventricular dilatation and hydrocephalus. So we need to be carefully monitoring such babies and if it is an intraparenchymal hemorrhages it can land up having the porencephalic cyst so if we could see that uh, with respect to the short term outcomes uh, when we uh, talk about preterm babies and the severity of ivh uh, in the first 14 days, the risk of deaths are higher when it is a grade 3 or uh, the periventricular hemorrhages associated. And most of the babies, like beyond 75%, will end up having uh, post-hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation if they survive further beyond 14 days. And when we talk about long-term sequelae, uh, grade 1 babies, hardly 15% of uh, them would uh, show a neurological sequelae. Grade 2, 25%. Grade 3, 50%. And grade Grade 4, uh, when it is like uh, associated with periventricular hemorrhages, almost 75% of the babies uh, will end up having neurological sequelae. If any time during the course of an ICU stay, baby lands up having hydrocephalus and requires shunting, uh, that also adds on to the uh, poorer neurological sequelae further in life. So this is just a repetition, won't go much into detail. And uh, regarding neonatal seizures, it is based on the maturity of the neonates, uh, EEG pattern at the time of seizures or even the background pattern of, on EEG and underlying neurological disease, which is the most crucial uh, part. So when we see in relation to the maturity, term babies, uh, they uh, don't get much of sequelae. But preterm babies who are less than 1.5 can land up having sequel in 40% of the cases. If the relation, as we have discussed, if there are severe abnormalities, like we talked about uh, marked voltage suppression or isoelectric uh, or burst suppression pattern on the uh, EG, the first part, then there is risk to have it uh, more than 90%, especially if the severe abnormalities persist even the next day or later. Moderate abnormality uh, can uh, give rise to neurological sequel in 50% of the cases. If the background activity is normal, hardly any baby has the sequelae later. 
dependent on the cause of what has caused the neonatal seizures if you could see hypocalcemia if it is a later onset hypocalcemia 100% of the babies have normal development with respect to hi if it is a grade 2 or grade 3 hi 50% of them especially with respect to grade 3 hi uh, uh, that will have major sequelae sorry but uh, if it is a grade 1 or grade 2, grade 1, uh, most of them, they will be normal. But grade 2, 50% of them can have normal development and uh, so on. Intraventricular hemorrhages, uh, like uh, most of them, uh, they have, uh, if it is grade 3 or grade 4, they will have sequelae. Only 10% will have uh, normal development. Even when we talk about hypoglycemia, 50% of the chances are there. If it is especially a refractory or requiring higher uh, percentage or uh, lasting for a longer time, uh, can have 50% of sequelae. And if it's the convulsions were because of the developmental defects, uh, most of the babies will end up having uh, bad neurological sequence later. Yeah. And regarding, uh, there is always a question, if there is a baby who has got uh, convulsions during the NICU stay, whether the baby will end up having epilepsy. Yes, there is still a risk. Uh, almost 50% of the cases, the baby can have epilepsy later, but this is also dependent on what was the cause uh, for the neonatal seizures. So excluding, if we exclude the febrile seizures, uh, yes, the prevalence is there in between 15 to 30% in preterm neonates and approximately 50% in term neonates. So these were my references and uh, thank you so much for a patient listening. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Vishali. It was a wonderful presentation and excellent and very well explained. And uh, I think you have covered most of the things and I just had uh, two questions. Uh, one was like any role of uh, uh, near infrared spectroscopy in prognostication? Yes, sir. so as I told that uh, most of the centers don't have it, but we, if we want to perform in the pre-cooling era, it was more of the N-acetyl aspartate peak, which was taken into consideration. And now, along with that, the ratio with lactate to N-acetyl aspartate, which was in the pre-cooling era, which we were taking into consideration, but since we are using therapeutic hypothermia, it is more of the peak of N-acetyl aspartate to the creatine, which has been uh, taken. If that is that peak is quite high, the prognostication becomes poorer Poor. later. Okay. The best part of MRS is that we can perform it slightly earlier to predict the outcomes. Okay. Like for MRI uh, uh, to get performed, we wait for one to two weeks. But here and with MRS, we could do it within a week's period as well. Right. So that's so, the So you suggest like the MRI should happen mostly at uh, two weeks so that uh, we get a better uh, understanding about what the uh, how much damage is and has happened yes the only i think the hurdle here comes with the re relatives you know while yeah. counseling uh, they don't want to wait you know when yes. you know, the yes. baby is critical yes. and serious they want like immediate mri so that you know they understand what will be the prognostication and then they will take a decision whether to go ahead with the treatment, treatment or withdraw the treatment. Yes, yes. But till the time in a week's period, we have multiple other things which will help us predicting the outcome. So if we take them into confidence, if we are using SERI very frequently or amplitude integrated EEG and yes. uh, overall our assessment about the baby, these are just test to support our prognostication, but also lies with uh, how the baby is progressing clinically. Uh, so that also helps to uh, get some, uh, this thing estimate about what is going to be the prognostication within the first seven days. And add-on can be taken as MRI if we are actually struggling to uh, find out whether we should continue treatment or not. Right. So that's what I would like to say. Right, right. And yeah. any, um, any role of any biochemical markers which kind of there are many kind of biochemical prediction. markers, like normally also we perform like multi-organ involvement if it is there, CPK, let it be creatinine and other aspects to it. So that has to be definitely done, which will right. also help us to find out whether uh, the baby has gone into MOTS or not. So that also will impact overall future uh, of the baby, especially when it is concer uh, concerned with the death. If the baby is in a bad uh, multi-organ disorder, function syndrome then right. uh, the baby might land up having death more yeah so yeah those were my questions uh, any questions coming from audience or viewers who are watching this program 
so i don't see any questions here right now yes um but we'll getting some questions on the once we post this on the youtube and thank so, you so thank you so much and helping us celebrate the national newborn week and thank you for taking time from your busy schedule and uh, you, it was a wonderful presentation thank you thank again. you so much sir yes. thank you for this opportunity thanks a lot thanks. thank you so with this uh, i'll end the session